Hello and welcome to another episode of Fan the Flames Live. Today I am excited to be talking with Sarah Longfield. I think Sarah and I have a lot of those kind of interconnections, those kind of overlapping spaces with art and theatre and, and kind of facilitation and all of that sort of work. So I'm really sort of interested to see what, what's our conversation going to be about and how we explore this idea that everybody has a flame and how can we nurture that flame, fan that flame, both our own flames, but also the flames of others through the, the work that we do. So let me allow Sarah to, to first of all, introduce herself. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Robert. I'm very happy to be here. So yes, I'm based in Glasgow. I know I don't sound like it, but I've been here 22 years and I'm a creative business and life coach. And um, prior to that, Originally, I started in theatre and I've worked a lot in participatory arts, encouraging people to be more creative in their everyday lives in various different ways. So when you, you started off in theatre, what, what was it that you were doing in that space? Well, if you'd asked me when I was 16, you know, what's, what's the goal? It would have been the first female artistic director of the National Theatre. Just ah. Yeah, I was going to do that. And then I realised at university that to get that job, I had to be quite serious about scripted drama and <laughs> I, I wasn't. Um, and around a similar time, a new professor arrived at the university, um, a guy called Baz Kershaw, who was all about performance out with traditional theatre settings, you know, where theatre occurs in community settings, mm. in ritual, in carnival, in festivals. And I really took to that. And I realized that where my passion lied was, in terms of theater, was working with people who weren't professional um, performers, who were young people, older people, people from all walks of life, who could get a greater meaning about the world and life and their place in it through making theater. So that's mm. what fired me up. Wow. So this just throws me back to the work I did with the London Bubble, where we talked about Augustus Boal and Forum Theatre and taking theatre into communities and creating theatre with communities because there was something just magical about how they were able to access the narrative or retell their own narratives through theatre, but in a very raw way mm -hmm. that just kind of really tapped into what was what what was happening for them and for their communities yeah and I think that's using kind of a creative process it doesn't necessarily have to be theatre but theatre is perhaps the one that it needs the least amount of kit you know <laughs> like when when I do um projects where you'd have a visual art person and you'd have mm. a dance person and a theatre person and I'd be the theatre person I'd rock up with just me you know some maybe I might have a stereo you know <laughs> a little cd player um that's dating me slightly but but in essence you can make theatre with absolutely nothing it, it's that storytelling thing isn't it it's gathering yeah. around the fire at the end of the day and sharing stories mm. and giving a platform it doesn't necessarily need to be that fancy stage with the proscenium arch it can be you know, just an area on a bit of ground where someone can share their story and you elevate it slightly. You make it that little bit more magical. You make this live moment powerful mm. just by turning it up a notch. And, and then they have authority to share their opinion. And there's something so wonderful about that. I've worked a lot with young people whose voices are constantly trampled on and ignored and uh, I ran a young people's theatre company in Glasgow for 12 years I was the artistic director there and to give those young people um, the power to know that their voice meant something that their yeah. opinion mattered was um, it was incredibly rewarding work to be able to help enable that to happen empower that to happen and and one of the things that I found when working with young people with with theatre was that 
once they realized that you were serious about giving them a voice, then they became serious about what they wanted to share. And all of a sudden, it wasn't just the, you know, we don't get to do what we want to do in life kind of stories that became these real in-depth, complex narratives that they wanted to share about their experience of the world. And all of a sudden you went, okay, yeah, they're young people. They know so much. There's so much richness here to be shared and for others to to hear and listen to and take part in. Yeah. And also... I think a lot of the young people I worked with um, were growing up in poverty um, and there was various, you know, complications and things that meant that that quite a few of them, their, their backgrounds were chaotic. Mm. So um, a lot of the work that we made wasn't directly autobiographical, but um, was also about escape, yeah. you know, being able to go away to your, your theatre <laughs> club on a Wednesday night, you could escape, you could yeah. imagine possible worlds and different try on different hats yeah you know and I suppose that's for me that's the connection with coaching you know I'm working with someone sorry to Greg (laughs) and let's bring it back to coaching (laughs) but I can get very um, enthusiastic about this because it's in a very intimate like one-to-one theatre setting almost Mm. where you're, you're creating a space for people to try on different hats yep and, and try different possible futures. And so I, I can see an absolute through line with all my work in, in what I'm doing. It's just, I'm just doing it in different ways. Absolutely. I, I, rem- I remember when I first came into coaching and sitting in a room where somebody was talking about open questions and saying, you know, asking you what, when, why, who, not, well, they didn't say why, but who, what if questions. And I was like, wait a minute, these are the questions that I ask myself when playing a character of the character I'm playing. And that, I think, has stayed with me and it kind of forms my coaching now in terms of that narrative space of, well, who are we being? What's the character that we're playing in this performance called life? And how do we want to shift that? So what different stories do we want to tell or what different characteristics do we want to embody in order to to tell a different story or to go down a different path or, uh, you know, create a new scene to our story, as it were, a new chapter. Yeah. And there's, I might be getting a little, stop me if I'm getting too theatre technical there, but, you know, like in narrative coaching, there's a lot of Stanislavski, you know, it's, it's the method, it's the system, you know, what was happening to your character the minute they, before that event, what happens afterwards, you know, how do the other characters interact? And for me, interestingly, when I made theatre, I, I hated that. I hated the method acting thing. It was like, get over yourself <laughs> um, and, and just play a role. But in, in coaching, I find that fascinating because it's real life. Yes. You know, we're not pretend. Yeah. Um, we don't have to, you know, have a complete breakdown on stage when, you know, in a Daniel Day-Lewis style. Um, but that, yeah, it's it's made me make peace. It's like a little sort of full circle mm. from the studies A-level where I'm like, actually, there's some validity in Stanislavski's stuff here. I'm yeah. And because it, it, I remember when I was, th- I was talking about theatre and coaching and saying, so this is, you know, where I see therapy existing as well. And this idea or we're breaking down what what makes up this character. And when this character isn't functioning in a way that it desires to, well, what do we need to go back and have a look at and explore? Why did that character do that? What was going on there? How can we make sense of that so that the character in the now can come to peace with that to create change and shift as they move forward? Not that I do therapy but my sense of Mm. that therapeutic way of working really kind of sits with this thing of well let's let's unpick these characters let's unpick Mm. this narrative and see where where it takes us because I think that unknown to me when I was first working with young people in theatre that what I was doing was coaching Mm -hmm. and we were also coaching through metaphor because we were looking at this story and going so what do what do we want to change in this story? What would make this character's life better? 
and that mm-hmm. was resonating back to them about well, what do they ch- want to change in their lives mm-hmm. and so there was all these kind of interactions taking place and I was just going we're making a show yeah but actually there was so much more taking place and now I look back at it and go wow that's why when we work with drama we have such impacts because there is so much happening in that space that goes beyond just making a show yeah yeah and that's that's what's so interesting I don't know yeah for me it was about yeah working with people where it wasn't about them making a living making that show you know as, as mm. working, working with professional actors it was it was a it was an addition to somebody's life. It was, um, you know, some way of enhancing yeah. what they do, uh, which makes it, it made it so rewarding. But yeah, I think that there's, there's something really interesting that, that I was working with a client very recently who's got a difficulty with their boss um, and they're just not meeting. And actually where my client was going was that realisation that it kind of didn't matter what the boss was doing. It was their reaction to it. Mm. And that's, yeah, that's where those kind of story, that storytelling comes in. And and it's so, you know, and, and that's, you know, on, it can be on the surface level, not necessarily on a deeply therapeutic level of, I'm just going to change how I respond to this. Yeah. And it changes everything. Yeah. 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 So when you're working in your one to, in your in your mini theater because now this reminds me of <laughs> I'm bouncing around all over the place now this reminds me of there was a company called Smallest Theater in the World they were based out in Deptford I, I don't think they're there now and they basically had a a motorcycle with a sidecar and the mm-hmm. sidecar they built into a theater that housed one maximum two people yeah and you had a little uh, uh, performance space that you could see. You'd sit in the sidecar and they'd perform to you, but they were also performing to the audience that were mm-hmm. watching. So it became very meta in its yeah. way of working. And when you said to me about, um, you know, that this new kind of creating theatre, I don't think you said creating theatre, but when you're working one-to-one with somebody, you're in a new kind of theatre space-ish. And how that is also this kind of meta space because you're working here with this person looking at so what's happening here in this relationship with what this person is bringing but then how is that impacting the world outside and how is the world outside impacting this this space Mm. i think i think a lot about temporary autonomous zones with this tell me more about that you know like like the Burning Man Festival is probably your ultimate Taz, your temporary autonomous zone, where it's from nothing, something happens, and then it disappears. Yes. And within that space, different things can happen. You know, you can challenge the status quo, you can move out of normal behaviours. Um, and, yeah, with my theatre stuff, we were very keen. There was no theatres in, in the area of Glasgow where we were working. And so we built theatres. And it was that same thing. It was like the, you know, the circus coming to down and then overnight mm. the circus disappears. It was creating that space that had no preconceived rules or it wasn't necessarily anyone's territory. You know, how can you create a space that, that's, that's got that kind of neutrality to it and also this temporariness where, where magic can happen? And I know that's a bit flowery, arty language, but I do apply that. And I think when I'm doing my best job as a coach is where I can subtly, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not bringing out the glitter curtain. You know? <laughs> Although some of my clients would bloody love that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've got, I've got, I've got the, the colour coded book, book it, bookshelf is, is, is subtle, but, but there enough, you know, there's a bit of spectacle. Um, but yeah, it's, it's creating that space. It, it, it is just turning it up a notch. And I say that when I'm, you know, teaching facilitations and, you know, how do you facilitate? You turn yourself up a bit. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether you're an enthusiastic sort of bunny like I am or whether you're quite a chilled Zen facilitator. You do need to bring 
a heightened version of yourself yeah. into the space. And I think that's the same in coaching. And it's tiny, but it makes such a difference in creating this temporary space, autonomous space for your client. And there's something that I hadn't seen before where it's temporary. And I'd, I'd never, it's so obvious, but I'd never really made that association to this idea that what happens in that moment, that that hour, let's say, of coaching, that's it. Once it's happened, it's happened. That's it. Yeah. And we might return to the themes, but it's gone. It's it's and it reminds me of you know when Nund and Bubble used to do promenade theatre and you'd arrive in a park, integrate the set into the park, do the show, and then it would disappear. Yeah. And if you came back a week later, there was no evidence that this thing existed but there was a reverberation in the system of it yeah and it's like our conversations with with coaches thinking partners clients whatever we want to call them have this reverberation in their system Mm -hmm. but if you look it's like well there's there's nothing there to go it came from there oh yeah and there's something really really, thinking that's really magic about that and also on zoom because i only coach online there's obviously there's an absolute artifice in in what we're doing you know to the point we were discussing this earlier you know zoom flips your image so you see what you see in the mirror you're not seeing the real view and so you're already in yeah this this artificial bubble but not necessarily artificial in a negative sense you know because it's that ephemeral place where you can try stuff out and it doesn't matter if it doesn't work because it's a moment. And and it's that, because this, this also is reminding me of mask work where you put on a mask and you're not you. So you're yeah. afforded other behaviors yeah, because you're not you. And when you take it off, you go back to being you, which also reminds me of Brenny Brown's work around, you know, what's the armor that we're wearing? And how do we strip ourselves of that armor so the true us can exist in the space? And it's like, how can you try on different masks until you actually go, wait, this this feels like a mask, but actually it's me and the mask is allowing me to exist in the space. Oh, I feel like half the people listening or watching are going, what are they talking about? <laughs> yeah, maybe. There'll be, there'll be a few theatre people kind of going, we're with but- you. Yeah. I think people get the idea that we wear masks and we wear different versions of ourselves to fit into spaces. And I think there is something very magical about this idea of there are these spaces that exist only in that time and in that space and in that time we can let go. Cause I think that's the other mm-hmm. thing that a coaching space enables is a, I can, I don't need to, to show up here going hey i'm great and aren't i wonderful it's like i can just show up and go Ugh, this is yeah. what's going on for me hmm. yeah yeah it's it's playing i suppose i use playfulness a lot but playing with creating that space so yeah you can just strip it all bare and be you So the, yeah, you can you can untangle the stuff because mm. it's. I suppose I speak in metaphor constantly, and now, I mean, this isn't even a metaphor. I've just got this sort of image. I always talk about a ball of wool being quite tangled. That that works for me, and um, it, certainly when I'm working with my coach, I have this ball of wool, and I'm kind of untangling each bit and untreading, and mm. it slowly becomes back to being a nice neat ball of wool. But it it sits in my chest and that's really hard to get to if you've mm. got your weight on and your chain mail and everything. Yeah. I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the image. <laughs> I, 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 more people I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the image of that though, because there's, there's something there for me around what is that sacred part of ourselves that, that, so this is, I think, part of what, where I get this calling to create Fan the Flames from. 
because it's asking that question of what is that piece of us that is hidden behind all of these layers that holds a greatness to it, holds a potential to it, but we, we hide it away. And how can somebody allow us the, the time, the space to show it the light or give it the energy or give it the attention that it needs to flicker into something more? Mm-hmm. And when you talked about, you know, the wall being behind all of these layers, it's like, how do we remove those layers? So we can actually take that ball of wool and go, well, here's the wall. What does the wall want to be? What is possible mm-hmm. for this? So we can enable that to happen. And maybe we need to put it back and bring it out again and put it back and bring it out again. And over time we then go, yeah. right now it's free. But if we never get the opportunity to, to look at the wall, if we never get the opportunity to, to pay attention to that inner part of ourselves, then we never get to be that roaring fire. We, we, we dim our light. And it comes down to creativity. Mm. You know, a word that divides people, because some people are quite happy, happily labelled as creative and others less so. <laughs> but, you know, creativity in its broadest sense is about using your imagination, solving problems imagining possible other futures mm. you know it's, it's that process that takes bravery it is about looking at the world and going what really is this what, what, what yeah. can it be I think maybe oh, this is interesting I think maybe I, I do enjoy coaching creatives hugely and that's probably most of my clients are creators because of my experience in the sector, and I think even though coaching's non-directive, mm. it's still, um, yeah, people like working with a coach who get it. Um, but I think there's something interesting there because they've already, they already do that bravery. And actually mm-hmm. it will be, it's not necessarily the creative act that's the problem. It sometimes is. You know, sometimes there's a block in terms of actually getting that thing made in in whatever form that thing is. Maybe it's a book, maybe it's a pot, maybe it's a painting, a dance. But most of the time, it's not the actual making because they've already made peace with that and they're they're quite, um, they've had lots of years of practice of being vulnerable in that way. It's more around the other stuff, like how do I market myself as a business? Mm. How do I actually make money from this? How do, you know, the the kind of, how do I fit in what feels like a very regimented world when I want to be? Yeah. Flinging my ball everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) But that's really interesting because they've already got this bravery there on the surface. Yeah. That, 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 that fires me up. And, and, and I, and there's this kind of different, bravery that's necessary to face the world so it you know there's i look at performers and i go they stand on stage in front of all of these people wow that there's a bravery to this and then there's a different vulnerability of going well how do i market myself how do i tell others about me so that they'll promote me that they'll put me on that they'll they'll agree to take me on into that that piece of work or how do I fit into a world where I don't get yeah, that paradox how do I fit into a world where I don't fit and I don't want to fit but I need to fit on some level in order to exist in this world yeah and the, you know and then there's a perception thing there isn't there about what what are you perceiving you need to fit into mm. which I think for both creatives and and those that deem themselves as non-creative that's one of the big questions isn't it you know there is a world that exists and you think you need to fit into it so what is the thing that you think you need to fit Mm -hmm. into what is the thing you think you should be doing is that a truth that's working for you or can you just reinvent the truth in that which goes back to that perspective thing isn't it yeah how does this character react to this thing yeah and which characters see it and which don't and which are in the space when it's happening and which are not Mm. 
what is is it um what's the what's the shakespeare with with bottom where they all go into the woods and have it's weird dreams dream, with some night's dream where they will have dreams and different perceptions of their relationships with each other and how they get tangled and untangled and there's something in, I, I don't know where I'm going with that but there's something interesting about the entanglement of relationships that we have and the perceptions that we have of relationships and how both theatre and coaching shine lights on that to go is that true mm -hmm. or what are the truths here because yeah you know everyone's bringing their own paradigm and their own yeah. truth yeah which I think is just hugely helpful. That's that's why, you know, if I feel coaching so rewarding as and, and I love being coached. Just digging into that, taking a moment without it getting too woo-woo, or you know, I, I avoided like self-help stuff for years. And to the, to my own personal development detriment, I think, because I was so too like, that's too hippie. Mm. Um, which is maybe ironic because, you know, as my mum said, but you're the hippiest person I know. I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Perception, right? I feel the story I tell myself is that I'm a very organised, pragmatic person. I just happen to work in theatre. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love the, these. I love those those perception ripples where somebody goes, "You're, but you're the hippie. I, you're the absolute <laughs> hippie." And you go, "No, I'm not. They're the hippie." And it's like, well, that's interesting. We're just kind of passing this down the line. And there's something interesting about what, when we embrace it. And go, yeah, I am a hippie. I'm just a raving hippie. That's what it is. <laughs> but they're more raving hippie than me because we always because I know that I do that I do this thing if I go yeah I like my crystals and I like my bees and I like to meditate but I'm not really like that no you're not that you're not woo woo are you and like I go well actually I'm completely that that's what I am and you know my, <laughs> my family look at me and they're just like we don't even know what planet you're on <laughs> yeah well I, I can empathize there <laughs> And I'm like, no, I'm grounded. I'm, you know, it's all about being here and now and in the moment. And then I hear my language and go, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I can see where they're coming from. Especially yeah. if I look at my 16-year-old self and where he came from and how he would look at me and go, that guy's just, what's, what's he on? Yeah. My 16-year-old self would be like, well done. That's great. <laughs> but it's maybe taken a few evolutions to get there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think mine would be very, I mean, that that's an interesting question there, isn't it? And, and we often use that in, in coaching, you know, what would your past self, what would your younger self think of you mm -hmm. now? And, you know, if your older self was to give your younger self advice, what would that advice be? And, 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 and that sort of thing. And I, you know, think, yeah, my younger self would be going, I can't believe you bloody did that. I can't <laughs> believe that, that you, you got, a, you got away with it almost. How are you doing that? How did that happen? Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? I'm actually, um, in my last session with my own coach, who, who also has a theatre background, drawn towards them, um, we were exploring, I forget, there is, there is one of the, the main kind of basic coaching books that's got this exercise in and I've, I've not even read it, but I like the exercise. <laughs> so the idea that, you know, you've got these different sides to yourself, these different roles that you have to play that kind of create these characters. And so I was, I was kind of really working in on defining these different characters and how sometimes they don't get on. Mm. Like there's, for me, there's what I call the nuanced adult, which is what I try and be professionally. In fact, you know, that's kind of like an aim across the board. I want to be a nuanced adult. But then there's also the playful joker who wants to tickle people with a feather duster mm. and create a little bit, n nothing too anarchic. Don't want to bring down all the systems, but just challenge things and kind of go, well, I know that's how it's supposed to be, but I don't really want to do it that way. Um, bit pirate in a good sense. Hmm. 
And then there's The Rock. You know, I'm a single mum who's been self-employed um, for the majority of my career. And when I wasn't self-employed, when I was running a theatre company, you know, we never really knew where our funding was coming from six months to six months. So it's always been, um, I've always been in a risky financial situation. It's always worked out. But I think then there's become the story of this rock. Mm. I'm the one that everyone can rely on. Yeah, that's not the best role to play constantly for yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, but but the interesting thing for me is how do these characters intersect? There's another one. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna expose that one. It's the one I like the least. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, I'm so curious now, but I- I'll accept. I'll, I'll give you a, it's the very judgmental one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um I got, yeah, I think I'm even blushing at the thought of a, a little bit. Of <laughs> yeah, but yeah, where, where these characters intersect, where, where you know, like, as, as I'm sure you, you work with your clients, you know, inner critics are useful. They stop you jumping off the cliff, right? You know, it's, it's really useful. But to identify these as critics or enablers or cheerleaders of different aspects of, of, of your life and, and the responsibilities that you have and everything is so useful because then I'm, I'm like, oh, that's, that's that rearing up. And actually, let's just go back to nuanced adult. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of my yeah. own little mini transactional analysis in my head. Yeah. I, with I, characters. I, it, it reminds me of the work of um, Nishi Patel, where she talks about, I can't mean exactly if she calls them inner selves or not, but this idea that we have these, a, a group, of characters that exist or a group of roles that we play out in the world and they can be in conflict with each other because they want and need different things but they can also sit and have conversations with each other to decide well who needs to be at the front now you know which which part of us needs to step up to to do this piece of work or to manage this situation whether it's a family dynamic or uh, or, or in the office whatever that might be so there's this like how do we agree how we're working together so that then there is this healthy dynamic and then she talked about this idea that there might be this rogue one that you don't notice that's kind of weaving in and out and causing trouble and chaos and I think part of what happens to us as, as as humans is we don't recognize that we're playing different roles or different aspects of ourselves. So when we are in conflict or challenge or we're, we're in a space of uh, inability to achieve or do, we don't go, wait a minute, which me is this that's, that's stopping me yeah. or that's in the way here? And which me do I need to bring forth to make this happen? Yeah. And that's fascinating, right? Because mm. mm. it's yeah. almost like we're all of the characters in the play. Yeah. Oh, the Pirandello. There's seven characters in search of an author. Oh. Mm. So, so that reminds me of, um, oh, what's it called? There's a, I'm, not in, I'm not in the room with the bookshelf. I'm looking like it's there, but it's not there. <laughs> oh, Let's pretend book- it's there. It's fine. It's there there. Uh, there it is. Right, so <laughs> there's a book called, I think it's called The Seven Plots, which which talks about this idea that there are only seven stories, yeah. but they are just told in different orders. So we think there are all of these stories of action when you break it down. There are just seven. It's a bit like uh, yeah. Joseph Campbell's idea about the monomyth, this hero's journey exists in multiple cultures, but it's one story. But we will attach uh, a meaning to this single story that exists in all the cultures yeah so go go back you said you said a phrase there about the seven st- no, the is seven it seven characters? characters in search of an author or in search of a playwright it's the P- pirandello play i read it years ago i, but I love that, that concept it's these seven characters who find themselves in the theater and they haven't got anyone to write them uh, that's Good interesting one. yeah because that that then calls forth that notion as you know the lives that we are living if so if we we live in my paradigm of of this is all a story that is being told and we can give power of the writing out to others to create our narratives or we can take the pen ourselves and we can go no i'm going to decide what my story is 
we can be in a state where we go, well, there's nobody to write my story. What do I do? How do I show mm -hmm. up? How do I behave? And I guess that can be that that sense of lostness that we can sometimes have. Where it's like, well, I don't have the pen. Nobody's got the pen. The pen's just floating in the ether somewhere. Yeah. And you know, it shows up in the littlest things. It doesn't need to be big life stuff. You know, like if I've gone for a, a freelance contract for something and didn't get it, I feel like that pen's been taken away from me. You know, I feel mm. like I've been waiting for the email to ping. And I find myself doing, like, not doing the work I should be doing, not doing the important stuff. I don't find myself, like, you know, looking at uh, kind of various job listing things just to see if there's any other freelance things I should, you know, chase mm. after. Because it's that idea that somebody else has got the pen and I need to find the person who's got the pen. Yeah. When actually bring it back in and go, no, what I need to do is the important bits of work that are sitting right in front of me. So I was just, I was listening to that and thinking, what have we been talking about for the yeah, last half gone, an hour? <laughs> Robert, it's gone around a bit, hasn't it? <laughs> I mean, I've loved it. Don't get me wrong. I've yeah, absolutely loved it. And I just was like, you know, has it been a, a journey of who are we in the world and where do we create where do we take our power from is it from ourselves holding the pen is it from the the world with the pen writing our own story and i and and something about who the characters that we play but also the the kind of the the theaters that we play these stories in and the environments that exist within that Yeah. Food for thought, which I suppose, you know, sometimes when I feel my chips are down, I'll berate myself for not, you know, coming on something like this and going, all right, here's my acronym. Here's my my beautifully polished model of, of how we should do stuff. But that's not how I work. You know, what mm. how I work is exploring these these fascinating things about how we make sense of the world and what's the yeah. meaning, what's the point, and, and going on these these adventures. It's much more interesting for me, anyway. Because I think the the adventures, because there's a you know there's an excitement and a spark about going on in the adventure that makes me want to go on more adventures as opposed to going oh that's that's the uh, t the tool that I use right I'll use that then and then it's it's like the adventure's over. Yeah. Whereas this makes me think about well where's the next play going to begin and what's Where's the next pop-up show going to happen in my life and in my world? And what's that going to be about? And what part am I going to play in that story? Am I just going to be a supporting character? Or am I going to be a lead? And all of that's kind of mm. running around my head. Oh, we'll get onto status games in a minute. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I think we should. we need to save status games for the next one. Yeah. Could we just do a whole conversation about status? That's fascinating. I think we should. I think we should. I, I used to do that for the, when I did some work with the NHS and we were working on, um, what was it called? Compassionate, it wasn't called compassionate behavior, compassionate leadership. We used to go in and play status games. So we used to have a, a mixture of teams and then we'd give them different statuses to play and mm. see how they manage that. And you'd have people going, this isn't my status. Well, yeah, no, but it's a game. But I, I, I'm not a two. I, I'm, 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 a, I'm at the top. It's like, but it's, it's just a game. Just noticing how they couldn't hand over status or control to others. And we're going, but this is, part mm. of the, this is where the problem sits, that that person knows more than you in that situation, but you're not allowing them to own it and to have it. But that's a whole nother story. It really is. I think that's the biggest skill, though, if you can, if as, as a facilitator, not as coach, but as facilitator, if you can support someone to be able to have happy, high status, mm. you know, that friendly, I can laugh at myself, high status and walk into any room with that, you know, like the Obamas, they're the kind of top happy, high yeah. status, you know, then, then, then the game's won, right? Yeah. And what's interesting, most of the people most of 
and that's a huge generalization. Some of the clients that I work with, part of their challenge is, is that they're working with unhappy high status. Because, um, yeah, the status comes anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Or they're trying to navigate the, the status of others in the work they do. Yeah. Whoa, that's a whole nother one we could delve into. So, so Sarah, I'm going to have to have you back and we're just going to have to, I don't know what we, what would we, it's like our sessions would have a, a theme or a tagline. I don't know what that would be, but it feels like. A, yeah, yeah, it's like where theatre meets coaching. Yeah. yeah. I want, I want it graphic. <laughs> Sparkly lights, lights around the mirror, a bit of glitter. And go. <laughs> but we're not, we're not too far out there. We're not too arty. We're quite grounded, normal people. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Whatever that means. So um, <laughs> where... Where can people find you? So they've listened to this, watched this, and they've gone, I want to work with Sarah. Where where do they find you? Just sarahlongfield.co.uk. That's my website, and everything's on there. You know, everything's on there. All the different yeah. ways people can work with me. Oh, I've very great. intentionally made it all in one place. And, and there's other bits coming in, too, actually, that have been other companies, other social enterprises I've run. It's all coming under one roof. So sarahlongfield.co.uk, and they can chat to me there. LinkedIn, Instagram. Yeah. Awesome. Brilliant. So Sarah, I've loved this and I can't wait till we do this again. So we'll get something in the diary and swing back round for more of our arty glitterball conversations. That's that's the title. <laughs> Brilliant. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. I really enjoyed it too. Thank you. Take care. Bye.